Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share this uh, presentation real quick. No, wait, this was the wrong one. Um, I'm just going to start already. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, your kings and queens and queers and children. I am very pleased uh, that I have been invited to this um, illustrious and uh, honorable uh, society. Um, of scholars uh, to tell you a thing or two about pink antiquity. Um, and I'm just gonna like start right away. The talk uh, is tentatively cost, uh, uh, called uh, The Revenge of the Galley, Transfiguring Lucretius. Um, and uh, I'm gonna explain to you everything about that in the next, I hope, 20 minutes. Um, but first things first, I wanna uh, give a Big thanks to Ryan ahead of time, because despite being the chair of this meeting, Ryan has also like assisted me greatly uh, as my constant interlocutor and uh, um, and uh, and uh, hmm, native informer of the classics world, so to speak. Um, right, please give an applause for Ryan ahead of time before I. Uh, before I talk lots of nonsense and then it, it'll, it won't punch as well anymore. All right, so all mistakes are mine, but all the good stuff that you'll hear, that's Ryan's actually. Okay. Um, also, this is an interactive performance uh, and your interactive part is sending lots of emojis um, because uh, as you may or may not realize, this is a live performance. Is I'm not gonna read out a script um, and I need, as it were, your um you are uh, you to counter sign what i'm doing so i want to encourage you to show your reactions to um the um whatever is going on uh, right now um through constant constantly feeding me emotions uh, and you'll you'll see how that makes sense in the end Maybe. Also, Ryan, can you tell me, can you give me a heads up after 15 minutes? Will do. Good. Great. All right. The Revenge of the Galley, Transfiguring Lucretius. This, uh, this um, talk will have an itinerary of three parts. I will first give you a brief crash course of Lucretian atomism. I will then tell you about the revenge of the, of the galley, and I'll explain to you who and what the galley are. And then I will uh, proclaim, or like my collaborator, uh, whom I'm also on the call with, uh, will proclaim the pink revolution right here and right now, and try to agitate you um, to overthrow the government and uh, take power uh, for a queerocratic regime. That's the itinerary in the next 20 minutes. Be prepared. All right, here's a crash course on atomism. What's the project of atomism? The pro project of Epicurean um, or like Lucretian atomism is, is the fight of fear. So Lucretius's idea is that like we are constantly afraid because shit can always happen. And he thinks that like we can, we can act against that if we know that like there are rules and laws of nature in place that make it impossible for crazy shit just happening out of nothing. So the enemy, um, if there's a conceptual enemy of uh, Lucretian atomism, it is ex nihilo nihil fed. From nothing comes nothing. So the idea is that, like, as long as there are gods who can just like whip out hardship for you and your life and your loved ones, you will live in fear. So in order to like fight fear, we need to fight this notion that like something came from nothing, and that also means we need to fight religion. So in a way, um, in a way it's a pretty radical proposal uh, for an author uh, from the first century before uh, the common era. Um, all right, so how, how is he gonna do that? Well, there are like three mm, conceptual moving parts that like uh, are substantial for Christian atomism. Um, the one is of course uh, the atoms, the smallest parts. Why do we need atoms? Well, Lucretia says, um, we do see that uh, things fall into parts. They come apart. They uh, like um, you can like 
rip a piece of paper into like smaller parts. It's like con, 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 um, constructed of these parts. And, uh, but Lucretius thinks that it cannot be the case that uh, there are infinitely many parts, because if there were infinitely many, um, infinitely many uh, kinds of things that like things fall apart into, then nothing would have any kind of stability. Um, and he also thinks that like, interestingly, um, these, um, uh, so he, he compares this as it were with the summer and winter. So he says like, there's like a spectrum of atoms and this spectrum of atoms um, knows a finite number of kinds of smallest parts, but the amount of smallest parts is, is infinite. That's not so, uh, it's important to know uh, there are these smallest parts um, that the, the world is made up of. So the next moving part is the vacuum. So he thinks that um, the, the atoms are as it were like coached in an empty space, a vacuum. Why is that? Well, he says, if the atoms were like moving through a space which was itself apart, or like if everything was like densely packed, then nothing could move. So he says like, without an empty space to move within, the atoms wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do anything. They couldn't, they couldn't go anywhere. Everything would just be stuck. All right. So if there are atoms, we also need, he thinks, we need this, this empty space. Okay. And then there's this like famous thing called the swerve. Um, so he says the, uh, so the atoms, um, they all, they in a determinate, at an indeterminate uh, time and an indeterminate place, they go nuts. So the idea is that like, uh, there's a minimal difference uh, from a straight line um, in which the atoms move that necessarily occurs from time to time within the path of the atoms. So moving by complete necessity in a straight line, then uh, everything would just like fall down as it were in the empty space uh, for eternity and nothing would ever collide. But the collision and the friction in the world is making the forms and uh, what's fun about the world. So uh, there needs to be like a little element of chaos, so to speak, in his system in order to, in order to make it work. All right, and that's the spurf. So that's like this, this minimal difference, the, the minimal possible um, disarray within the path of the atoms. All right, so these are the, the three like crash cores moving parts uh, of a, um, Lucretian atomism. Um, we wanna fight fear and we do it with atoms, the vacuum and the swerve. All right, now plot twist. Atoms are like letters. <clears throat> this is gonna be important for us, not just because we're philologists, but also um, because it's going to um, inform my argument. Okay, he says as much here. You can uh, read it or just believe me. Um, the idea is that the combination of, uh, of atoms is just like the combination uh, of, um, of letters and of parts of words uh, in, in language. So the model on which he builds, as it were, his understanding of the whole universe is actually language. And that's interesting because as you may or may not know, um, this uh, book that Lucretius is writing called On the Nature of Things um, is a poem. So it's a long poem. So in the um, performance of describing the world in its, uh, in its most fundamental principles, Lucretius is simultaneously enacting this principle. All right? So, it's it's a it's a it's a poetic text because um, in poetics you can see the materiality of language in place because you have to work with rhymes you have to work with meters and the um, and not all 
words fit the meter and not all words rhyme with each other in a way. So, um, and this is, uh, this is going to um, return in our, in our argument. Um, but for now, just, just, uh, just remember that um, the atoms are organized like letters and the whole setup of uh, Lucretius's philosophical investigation mirrors or reperforms uh, the order of nature itself. It performs the order of nature, as it were. All right. Um, that would be the Latin. Um, so the Christian poetry is itself a performative proof of his work. And um, if you now think, oh, that's a crazy idea. This is like ancient nonsense. We are over this. Uh, ask me about uh, Derrida's take on uh, DNA in uh, live death in the 1970s, because as it happens, it seems that like um, biologists to the present day still have like similar ideas of like the combination of uh, parts of DNA as a combination of, uh, of letters. But this is just a drive by Let's wave to Derrida over there. Can you see him on the left? OK, great. Next part. So now we have like a general understanding of uh, Lucretius, the Lucretian project. Now let's talk about trans misogyny. Um, so you, you, you do remember that the whole book is uh, directed against fear. And uh, fear comes from nothing uh, that from, from the fact, from the belief that things follow from nothing. But it can also stem from the wrong combination of things. So there's a, there's a correct combination of things um, as in the, the poetic expression, but also as in like, I don't know, nicely formed pencils uh, or whatever. Um, and there are like wrong combinations of things. And there are like several passages where he says, oh, you know, there are monsters out there. They don't have a mouth and they don't have legs and they're disfigured and it's terrible and it's happening out there scary things um all right so one thing is uh, the conceptual creation from nothing and the other one is the wrong combination of things all right um now one of like these like interestingly uh combined uh, elements that occurs in his in his text is what is called the galley. Um, and uh, I can't see my own, but you can probably see uh, the citation, um, but the quote is gonna come in a second. All right, so there's a part in the second book of Lucretius's uh, On the Nature of Things, where he starts talking about uh, the great mother, Magna Mata, uh, and her priests, the galley. And I'm gonna make this like very short um, so the Magna Mater uh, is, a, is a mother goddess that symbolizes, as it were, the whole of nature. Uh, and her priests, <clears throat> or like the, the, uh, the rite of initiation of the priests is self-castration. Um, and after self-castration, they put on um, female clothing and uh, roam the streets, making music, being loud and fabulous and uh, begging for money. All right, I think that's basically enough for, for us to know right now. So you have like a kind of like trans character here in the, in the galley, but like at least in gender non-conforming character. Some people in the research think they're non-binary characters. I think it's, I'll just say trans in an anachronistic way. We don't know what it means yet. All right, like, okay, so there are, so this is a, a social institution in the Roman in Roman society. Um, and when he introduces them um, in his book, in like a brief sentence, he introduces them like this. Why is this not working? Okay. So he says, um, because to produce uh, throughout the work, they assign her the mother god as the galley because they would shoe by this type that they who have done violence to the divinity of the mother and have proved ungrateful to the parents are to be deemed unworthy to bring a living offspring into the borders of light. Here's the Latin. Um, so 
what is his point? His point is if the power of procreation is not honored, then, uh, or like, the, and the, like the, his point is that the galley are reminding us of the, um, of the sin against the power of procreation. Why do they do that? Well, because they castrate themselves and they like tell as it were uh, of this of the self uh, castration. So the galley are reminders of infertility and that you might think that that looks like a kind of like transmisogyny, um, meaning that uh, they, they, are, they are reduced as it were uh, to, a, to a terror, to a threat, to like monsters that you should stay away from. Um, so he's working, uh, so he's working them in as uh, as figures of fear. He's also working them in as figures of religion, and we know already that uh, religion is what we want to oppose. So it seems in the passage as though we wanted to oppose the galley. Um, all right, um, but um, and this is not actually an accident like this, this enmity against the galaxy. Because as I have, uh, I, I have said earlier that he's an atomist, but atom is actually a Greek term that he doesn't want to use because it's one of his projects in, this, in his poetic, um, in his poetic uh, text uh, is to translate, as it were, the Epicurean Greek thought into Latin. And he has big problems doing that. And one of the problems doing that is with the term atom. So like smallest part. So he has to come, he comes up with a whole uh, lot of um, alternative terms, metaphors, and many of them are actually related to um, fertility. So you can see in this quote that I put here, <clears throat> uh, various terms that he's using, for example, materium, genitalia corpora rebus, um, semina, and um, corpora prima. And at least some of them, two of them, materium and genitalia corpora, um, are related to fertility. Uh, regarding the second one, genitalia, uh, wasn't the term genitalia, which like, which like sounds like a, a contemporary um, English genital, um, wasn't actually used as uh, in this way, in this like way of like sexual organs, um, for a long time. But actually. Um, but actually, uh, Lucretius is one of the first people to actually use it in this way. So here's another passage uh, where he does use genitalia in this way of like sexual organs. So it seems as though like one of the one of the terms in which he um, re-inscribes uh, the smallest parts, the atoms, the basic uh, units of his whole philosophy into the Latin language is through this notion of, of fertility. Uh, right. Another one is, uh, is materium. So uh, materium has a common root with matter, which means mother. <clears throat> materium, uh, like these like basic materials, so to speak. So there's an other connection between like the the fertile uh, parent uh, and the smallest parts of his of his philosophy, and this is actually what the Galilee passage is all about: is about a juxtaposition between the religious conception of nature as such through the magna mater, which is the mother goddess, which is which is all of nature, and the Epicurean conception, nature made up of smallest parts, particles, at atoms, or materium. So it's like exactly this juxtaposition uh, between the matter and the and the materia, as it were. So, and then he ends the passage on saying, "Where is this noise? What's in oh, yeah. On saying, basically, this is my paraphrase. Uh, it's okay to call to call this magna mater if only we keep in mind what it really is, namely a bunch of atoms, a bunch of materiums. All right. And this is the passage where the galley occur as the self castrating. Uh, gendered other. And now we can see that the existence of the Gali's voluntary infertility, infer, infertility is a serious threat to Lucretius's problem because Lucretius, the, 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 or like a project, because the project that Lucretius is having is to, is to rethink 
nature as such as made up of fertile elements, whereas the galley, as it were, stand for infertility. So like, it's not just, you know, although it's like this one sentence only, they actually oppose his whole project by voluntarily deciding against the order of nature, um, if you will. All right, so, but let's, uh, let's, um, all right, yeah. Let's look back into, um, into these passages because it looks as though, um, the, um, as though the galley could take revenge. And uh, that's, uh, that's my actual point. Okay. So Lucretius admits in this passage that uh, his Latin is awkward and he must make new words uh, given the poverty of our language and the newness of the subject matter. All right. Um, so Lucretius deliberately coins these terms that I just that, that I've just shown you, materiem, uh, um, corpora prima, etc. Et so he, he intervenes into the language in order to make a point that the language itself cannot make. Um, so. In a, in a way, there's something missing in the Latin terminology, and it is suggested by an incursion, a cat, in the language, an unnatural linguistic intervention. And this is enabled, of course, by the composability uh, of letters, of words and phrases. So, like his 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 ability to to translate Epicurean atomism into Latin is enabled by his atomism, as it were, by the fact that things can be combined in ways in which they are usually not being combined in wrong ways, in grammatically and linguistic wrong ways that enables his whole project. Now, remember that his project is not just a philosophical descriptive project, it is also a poetic project, deliberately, all right? But his po whole poetic project rests on the possibility of these wrong combinations, all right? So by Lucretius' own analogy, this code should count for the atoms as well, because atoms work like language, language works like atoms. All right. In fact, the wrongly composed elements cannot be prevented. Lucretius says as much uh, in another passage that I'm, am I going to show you this or am I not going to show you this? No, I'm not going to show you. Um, but he says in, in, in another passage um, that monsters and androgynous people who are like man and woman or neither um, happen. This combination does occur, but he says, even though it does occur, they are infertile. They cannot procreate by themselves. All right. So there's this passage in book two. Um, right after the galley where he says everything is just fine and uh, things just happen in the in the right way and they're only combined in the right way but then later in book five he says no nah, you know there are also like these like all these like monstrous things including like you know like intersex people is I think what he's referring to here um but thank god you know they happen and then they can't then they're infertile then they can't procreate okay um, but my point would be that he can't actually stop them from creating offspring. So although there's like wrong combination, wrong combination of, uh, of elements, he can't really stop it to like produce, um, to produce any, uh, uh, any knowledge or any uh, new people, even. Um, I should say, and I think it's that's... definitely been fifteen minutes. By the way, all right, then I'll then I'll jump. Uh, I think it's a good moment to jump, um, because in fact, if you if you look at his own book, his own book, which is like lost in uh, in the archives and then rediscovered in 1417 in a German monastery gives rise as it were to the uh, European Renaissance. Um, and uh, so although 
he uh, has to make these like weird incursions and to mutilate his own, own language and to castrate, if you will, uh, his, own, um, his own system because it is, because it is uh, by itself already mutilated and castrated, right? Because it is by itself incapable of doing what he wants it to do, despite this like mutilation all around, his text still produces European Renaissance and modernity. So in a way, um, the, the existence of his text itself contradicts his enmity against infertility. Uh, right. Um, now we need to jump. So the mutilation is primary, is my point here. Um, and we could say that actually Lucretius is not oblivious of this, because after the, in the end of the question of the, the passage on the galley, he says, well, you know, you can call this like the great mother, or you can call it nature, but you just shouldn't be so religious about it. All right. Um, and you might think that uh, actually he's just re recounting a religious myth here, uh, where, um, where you might think that the galley actually stand uh, or stand in for another crucial aspect of his philosophy, which is, um, which is the vacuum. Uh, which is the, uh, the generative force uh, of, of the absent of that which is not there, which provides the, the ground for things to move to move through. All right, uh, that's my little introduction to, um, to Lucretius. Now give me a brief uh, round of applause uh, to introduce my, my collaborator, which is a comrade Josephine. Thank you. All right, comrades, I thank uh, my collaborator Luz Delier for her um, lovely introduction. I will now show you um, that there's more to the story than you might think. Uh, and what there is more to the story is actually the forgotten history of a pink revolution. So um, the pink revolution is the, is the internal eternal struggle between two classes, which is uh, the queer class. The queer class is those aspects of, your, of yourself uh, that do all the libid libidinal labor and that like produce desire, surplus desire that can be captured and uh, exploited by other people. Um, and moreover, this uh, libidinal, um, this desire, this libidinal labor is being constantly policed. So, my idea is here, or like our experience over thousands of years of pink revolutionary work, is that some people produce surplus desire and some other people uh, put borders on it, restrict it, and tell you what to do with it. And some of these people think that the police is not their problem. Some people think that they, that they benefit from the protection uh, of police forces. And as an abbreviation, we call those the pimp class, the police is not my problem class. Um, so these are the people uh, that, uh, you know, like professors, police officers, um, producers, uh, teachers, these people, people that like benefit from your desire to get something from them and put, put you in a little cage. All right. Um, as the pimp, uh, the queer revolution, of, of course, must consist in the abolishment of, uh, of the pimp class. Um, and our experience is over the last few thousands of years um, that uh, there are three kinds of trans people, the dead trans people that are just uh, killed, um, sometimes upon birth, uh, queer collectives uh, or trans collectives such as the galley, who never show up in Lucretius's text as individuals, but only as a collective um, and exceptional individuals. Uh, and one of these intellect, uh, exceptional individuals I want to uh, introduce to you today. And that is in fact, Lucretius herself. Because my, my claim is that Lucretius herself was herself a galley, herself a trans person. There is a historically grounded connection between Epicureanism, Epicureanism and the galley actually uh, here. Uh, Diogenes Laertius uh, 
reports from a saying of Atsasial Laos, uh, he says, to the person who asked why people went from other schools to that of Epicurus, but never from Epicureans, he said, Galloi are made from men, but never men from Galloi. So of course, he's referring to the, to the act of self-frustration, but conceptually, I would say, he's also referring uh, to, the, um, to the power of the vacuum, all right? So once you accept that, that like things that like the absence of something can exert a power, as Silas says, there's no way back. All right. So you might think that this is just a jab, but as we know from uh, our oral history of thousands of years of pink revolution, this is actually a real thing. There were many intellectual uh, galloi organized uh, among the Epicureans. Uh, so Atasilaos has a point here, although he's from the enemy forces, he was a skeptic, he was the leader of the academy, uh, he was very well situated in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a major proponent of the pimp class. All right, um, so what happened to Lucretius? Uh, we don't know, you might think, because there's only two sentences uh, extent about, about her life. Um, but I'm going to tell you from the annals of the oral history of the Pink Revolution, Lucretius actually drank a love potion at some point in her life, uh, um, which liberated her desire. So this was, a, this was a potion that turned her into a primary queer revolutionary, opposing the forces of the pimp class who are exploiting the libidinal labor uh, of all of us at all points, um, turning her trance. And, um, so she deliberately cut out um, passages of her own book, which we today see as like uh, as like a, a mutilated or like a uh, like missing passages in the um, in the text at its extent, um, thereby turning her own text into a galley of sort. So she was not only. Uh, castrating herself, but also deliberately castrating her own text because she knew that this would actually produce a massive number of, uh, of offspring. But of course, she had to like, for political reasons, she had to cover this over in her own text, all right? Which is why the Galloi only appear as this, uh, as this side note in her text um, and remain uh, in her and their their position in the end remains elusive, right? She, she's not turning around in her text saying, by the way, the Galloi are the heroes. She's just gonna say, here's the religious picture and here is the, um, uh, and here's, I'm gesturing towards a more scientific, more Epicurean picture. Now, this history was forgotten, of course, during a large scale murder of Galloi and trans people in later antiquity, which was also completely covered over by history because it was so successful. So there was actually a large scale pink revolution uh, on the back of the Galloi um, on the way in the later Roman Empire, which was stopped um, with, uh, with pure violence, which is why uh, we don't know about it. It's only me as a champion of the pink revolution who can tell you about it. All right. I'm just going to like give you three hints on like what a pink revolution could uh, could look like now, um, and then I'll be finished. So if you want to join the pink revolution, you should think about poisoning the waters, the drinking water with testosterone blockers, because obviously uh, masculinity and cis masculinity, uh, especially, is one of the major problems of our time. Secondly, down with capitalism. You need to sabotage all couple forms wherever you can, starting with white heterosexual cisgender uh, couples as the top of the pimp line. Uh, I recommend that you go on, a on an immediate reproductive strike for these couples. So whenever they have problems and they seek your advice and your counsel, you say, no, I'm not gonna help you with this. These, uh, these relationships are gonna implode in no time. And uh, this is going to uh, bring about um, full bureaucracy now is our, is our slogan. 
uh, for the liberation of the forces of libido and uh, the um, downfall, the projected uh, inevitable downfall of um, the PIM class. That's it from me. These are the three slogans. Thank you.